Hello everyone, this is Jonathan Little, and I am here with part two of the second week of WeeklyPokerHand.com, where I take a hand that I or someone else played and review it for you guys and let you know all of my thought processes. In this part of the video, I am going to be reviewing what the way my opponent played their hand against me, and I'll let you know what I think about their play. First off, uh, whenever we have about 50 big blinds, I would much prefer raising to around 75 instead of raising to 90. Just because you want to keep the pots as small as possible. That way you can lose more hands, and it makes it tough for you to actually go broke in the tournaments. But raising to 90, you know, 15 more chips may not sound like a big deal, but whenever that 15 chips compounds by the end of the hand, it allows you to get the whole stack in relatively easily, and that's not really what you want, especially whenever you have a hand like Jack's that's going to be put in a lot of tricky spots post-flop. So the flop comes king 3-2 and the pocket jacks decides to continuation bet for 130. I think this is perfectly fine. I have no problem with this whatsoever. And I, J Card Shark, calls over here. When J Card Shark calls, I would generally put someone in the spot on either a slow played monster, a king, or a draw. As I stated in the last video though, I probably can't have too many draws here besides um, maybe like ace four or ace five of spades and that's pretty unlikely so that really tilts my hand range towards something like pairs between fours and kings and a king and Jax really isn't doing too well against that range the turn is six so now the Jax now loses the pocket sixes as well and he likes to check he checks um, J Card Shark bets 270 into 485, and at this point with pocket jacks, I think you need to get away from the hand quickly without really a second thought. And the reason for this is because if a spade does not come on the river and you check and your opponent shoves, it's a pretty bad spot. If a spade does come and you check and your opponent shoves, you pretty much have to fold. And there are also a few bad cards that may allow your opponent to backdoor into a win, like an ace, particularly, or um, maybe even pocket uh, five or a four if your opponent does have pocket fours or fives at this point. So really, there's not a whole lot of good that can come by calling here, unless you think Jay Card Sharks is an absolute maniac, which he isn't. I can, I can be pretty confident saying that I'm not a maniac. Um, so right here with pocket jacks, I think this is the turning point in the hand where you have to fold. But Obar decides to continue in the hand. The river's a five, and now the board is king, three, two, six, five. The spade draw missed. And Oban checks. I'm oh, sorry, Obar checks. J card shark goes all in. And I think right here again with pocket jacks, you just have to find a fold. The only reason you can justify a call is maybe thinking that J card shark would not go all in with a king here. If I'm sitting over here with king queen though, I think I would probably play it exactly the same way. This is one of these spots again where Obar's hand cannot really be a straight. So king queen's ahead of basically everything besides ace king, which if Obar had ace king, I, he should play the exact same way he's played these jacks. But I don't think most players are actually going to play ace king like that. So in this spot, Obar has to try to figure out what he can beat. Anytime you get to the river, you always need to try to see which hands you can beat and which hands you lose to. So we already talked about which hands he lose to, loses to. But now what hands does Obar actually beat? One big issue in this hand is that Obar has the jack of spades. And that really discounts a lot of J Card Shark's flush draws. So say I, uh, J Card Shark has ace jack of spades, which he, he normally could have in his range. He can't have that now. Same thing goes for queen jack of spades and jack ten of spades. So now the only flush draws I can really have that missed are ace five, ace queen, and maybe ace ten, and maybe queen ten. So there's only a few combinations of the flush draws that missed. And as I said, I, I could easily have a king here, I could have a four, or I could have pocket fives. I could also have pocket twos or threes or sixes. So the only thing Obar beats here is really the stone bluff with the flush draw. And whenever you only beat like four or five combinations of hands, but you lose to like 30 or 40 combinations of hands, you really just have to find a fold on the river. Um, this is called combinatorics. 
you can look that up online if you want to read more about how to figure out the different combinations of hands and how to um, figure out if you should call or fold, especially particularly on the river, but it applies to every street really. But right here, this is a spot where Obar's hand just loses to basically my entire range, so he has to find a fold here. The real turning point in this hand, though, is the turn, because if Obar does not put in the 270 chips here, he certainly wouldn't feel needed to, or feel pressure to put in the three, the 900 on the river. So this is where he really messed up, and the turn, the turn and the river were both pretty terrible plays, in my opinion. And he should have only lost 250 chips in the hand, and instead he lost the whole stack. So I hope you guys enjoyed this podcast. If you guys have any questions or comments, feel free to let me know at support at JonathanLittleSecrets.com. And I, I thank you very much for watching.